Uh, okay, yes, thanks, Dolly. Uh, let me just um, get my, my slides in. So, uh, yeah, I hope you'll find this presentation useful. Um, I put together, I think, a nice uh, presentation. I, I know the, the audience is uh, not non-medical, so I, I put together uh, this talk, which I hope will be interesting. Um, let's, let me try and share this screen. Yeah, so um, the topic is evolution of heart disease treatment in the 21st century. So uh, of course I'm, I, I'm aware that most of, most of us here are not doctors, so I've, um, I've kept it simple. Um, and I thought rather than, than uh, speak on individual heart conditions and the treatment, perhaps it is important to appreciate uh, how newer treatments emerge and what we have to do to get these uh, new treatments evaluated and how we select the right sort of treatments for the different uh, heart conditions. Because if we look at heart disease, there's a whole spectrum of heart disease and a whole range of treatments for them. Uh, and, and newer treatments are emerging all the time. Uh, and yet doctors uh, uh, have a way to uh, recommend or advise on the right sort of treatment. So how actually do we do that? Uh, uh, there is a bit of science to it. Um, and uh, let me see if I can, can, can you see my slides? Uh, are you seeing my slides? You are? Yes, we can, Dr. John. Okay. Yes, the title. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, why, why do we need to treat heart disease? I, I think the, um, it's important to understand that uh, we, we don't just treat heart disease because you've got it, but heart disease in general has an impact, impact on uh, your survival. It, it does uh, cause you to, um, to live or um, affect how long you live. Uh, but very importantly also is the quality of life because it can have a significant impact on your quality of life with chest discomfort, uh, shortness of breath and lethargy, uh, for, for example. So the aim of treatment for the heart disease is of course to improve your survival, help you to live longer, but not just to help you to live longer. I think it's also important that it is able to improve your quality of life because there's no point living longer if you do not have the, a good quality of life in the extra years which the treatment is providing. Uh, so these two go hand in hand and, and are very important. Um, and over the years, of course, new treatments have emerged. Uh, we have more effective treatments uh, for the uh, heart conditions. And these newer treatments also come with reduced risk. Because any treatment has got some risk attached to it. Um, tr new treatments are never without any risk. But uh, it's important that when we develop new treatments, we ensure that these new treatments, newer treatments, uh, 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 effective, but also have a reduced risk. And over the years also, the reduced invasiveness uh, is, is coming into play in that we have to provide the treatment with the minimal, uh, uh, minimal uh, disruption. So the best, the, the least invasive is of course, just taking a pill, taking some medication, but often that is not enough. And then you have to do some, maybe some intervention uh, like putting a stand, um, uh, sometimes it's not enough, then you might need surgery, you know. Uh, so how can we make it less invasive? And that's where the treatments are evolving to, to make it more effective, but at the same time, uh, less invasive to, uh, to patients. Uh, and newer treatments are emerging because we have a better understanding of disease, diseases to to be able to provide uh, an effective treatment, we, we need to know how, how the disease uh, comes about, what causes the disease to progress, and only then can we interrupt the natural history of the, of the disease. And if the disease causes some structural problems to the heart, then we need to know how to fix it by, by surgery. 
So, and this is where the importance of research, because the research has allowed us to gain a better understanding of the various diseases. And because of that, we have now got uh, some very effective treatments for all the different heart conditions. But it's not good just uh, coming up with new treatments. We also have to evaluate these new treatments to see if they're effective or not, to see if it's useful uh, and to see if it is effective both in the short term and the long term. Because after all, one of the key things in treatment is to help you to live longer, to improve your survival. So we have to make sure that the newer treatments uh, are able to achieve it. It's not, it's not just helping you to feel short or better uh, in a few, for a few months or a few years, but it's, it, we have to make sure that it helps you to feel better for the, for the rest of your life and actually helps you to live longer. So we, have, we need ways to evaluate uh, these newer treatments. And after these newer treatments have been evaluated, then uh, we have to put all this information together and come up with recommendations. So each of the uh, special, specialties, including uh, heart specialty, lung specialty, uh, we have our professional uh, associations, both nationally and internationally, who look at all this uh, data all the studies on all the, the treatments available, and we come up with recommendations on how we should be treating the various uh, heart diseases in the form of guidelines. So we publish clinical practice guidelines. Uh, and then after the guidelines are published, it has to be accepted, it has to be accepted by the doctors who are actually providing the care to patients. So the, the, the uh, authors of the guidelines have to be aware that the guidelines have to be based on, on science and also has to be acceptable to both doctors and to patients as well. So this is how some of the uh, things which comes about uh, in uh, newer treatments. So when we are evaluating the treatments for, for heart disease, particularly the newer treatments, first of all, we have to confirm the safety of the treatments. And then we have to confirm the effectiveness of the treatment. Uh, and once we know this too, we then have to balance the risk of the intervention or treatment against the benefits. So the, of course the benefits have to outweigh the risk. If the risk of the intervention uh, is so high, uh, then, then uh, it's probably not uh, the right sort of treatment to provide. So always we have to balance the, the risk of the intervention versus the benefits. Now, some of this, of course, can vary between different patients because in some interventions, if you're talking about heart surgery, for example, uh, it's generally very low risk, but some patients have particularly particular conditions which increase the risk of the, of the intervention. Uh, for example, if a patient is very uh, elderly or have a lot of other medical conditions, uh, or have a heart which has got very weak already and very enlarged, then the risk of the intervention may be a lot higher in that particular patient. So, so the, that's where the treatments will have to be tailored for each patient. So each and every patient is different. So although we can come up with guidelines, the guidelines will specify that uh, uh, is different in different patients and we have to evaluate each patient individually uh, and then determine the benefits of the treatment or intervention uh, for that particular patient and what the risk of this treatment or intervention is uh, for, for that patient. So to evaluate the treatments, um, it all starts with preclinical studies. So any treatment, whether it is a medication or whether it's this, a new surgical technique or a new surgical uh, equipment we have, uh, we have to test it out first in the lab laboratory. Uh, we can we test it out in the laboratory on uh, molecules uh, in the case of medication, and then we test it out on, uh, on animals. Uh, and then we have to practice it on animal tissue or, we, or develop models. To, to see if this uh, new technique or new treatment is likely to work in, uh, in patients. And once we have established that the treatment is likely to be successful in patients, then it comes on to uh, clinical studies. And 
uh, what we call pilot clinical studies. So these are small scale clinical uh, studies in a small groups of patients to determine the safety and also the effectiveness of this treatment. And then once it's got through this stage, we see that in, in small studies, the treatment is effective and it is safe. Uh, then we go on to bigger observational studies involving perhaps hundreds of patients. But often in this, uh, what we call observational studies, we still have no uh, comparison. So to, to evaluate whether a treatment is more effective compared to an existing treatment, uh, we will need to do a clinical trial. So this is essentially uh, assigning patients in, at random to two different groups and then determining which of these two groups would do better. Uh, so I would say that almost all the uh, current treatment for heart diseases have gone through all this stage, uh, including clinical trials. And so I think you can be quite assured that, uh, that the treatments recommended uh, for you by, by, your, by your doctors uh, have been proven to be, to be safe and effective uh, and to be uh, beneficial to, to you. So uh, I thought I would uh, cover one example of where we have developed newer uh, treatments um, and the process it has gone through. So this is the aorta. So the aorta is the, the main blood vessel which leaves the heart and, and goes to the rest of the body. Um, are you able to see my cursor? I, I don't know. Uh, yes. So, so this is the aorta. Uh, this is the normal size of the aorta. So you can see here that it has got dilated or it's got bigger, it's ballooned out. So the problem with this is that um, um, it will progress in most of these cases. And of course, like a balloon, if it gets too big, it will then tear and it will then, uh, it will then rupture. So when patients have this condition, uh, they have an, uh, a risk of what we call aortic dissection, which is a tear or an aortic rupture. So the conventional treatment for this condition is to replace the uh, dilated part of the aorta, the aortic aneurysm. Of course, this is quite a big surgery because uh, the coronary arteries, that this is the blood supply to the heart. You can see here, this one, this is one of the coronary artery. This is the other one. They attach in the same place. So to replace this part of the aorta, you have to detach the coronary arteries. You have to put in a new aorta. This is made of a uh, very strong waterproof cloth, essentially. And then you have to reattach the coronary arteries. So it's a big, big operation, uh, but still we, we, we do do a reasonable number of these uh, operations. Uh, and this is still the, the standard treatment for, for this condition. Uh, but when I was in London, in uh, this must have been in about two, the, uh, the, the late or mid 2000, we had a patient who had this condition. And uh, his, his name is Tels Ghostworthy. And this patient is an engineer by profession. And he started asking, um, asking us, he said, uh, why do we need to replace he now his aorta was starting to get big but it had not reached the size that we would normally want to replace the the aorta but we had told the patient that uh, we have to monitor your the size of your aorta and it is very likely that in the next five years we will need to do surgery to replace the aorta so then he asked us you know, uh, why can't we just strengthen the aorta he's an engineer and they say uh, surely we can we can uh, design some material to strengthen the aorta. So we thought that that, that was a reasonable suggestion. It was, of course, very new, not the, the standard sort of treatment. And we discussed with the some of the scientists at Imperial College. And uh, we thought, yes, it's a reasonable suggestion. So uh, so that's what we did. We, we came up with this personalized external aortic root support. And this is the strong material which is uh, manufactured. And, and this is used to wrap around the, the aorta, which is starting to dilate, uh, to strengthen it and prevent it from uh, getting any bigger. So um, 
The important thing with this was that it has to be custom made. That's why it's called personalized, personalized ex, uh, aortic root support. So at that time, we used uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, uh, but you can use CT scanning also to, to acquire images of the aorta and to determine the geometry of the aortic root. And from, from this, we, we manufacture the, this supporting wrap. Uh, essentially, it's a form of 3D printing uh, at a more advanced level. And once this is man manufactured, we then uh, wrap this around the dilated aorta. So it still requires surgery, but it's a lesser uh, invasive surgery. And the risk oh, is, uh, and the surgery is uh, of a lower risk. Yeah. So, so this, uh, and of course we have to, because this is essentially the first immense study then, uh, you had to go through the necessary ethics uh, approval. Uh, and initially we did this in the first 10 patients and the excellent results from, uh, from this. Uh, then it went on to an observational study uh, involving 20 patients. Um, so uh, part of the way uh, medicine progresses is we when we have a new uh, discovery or new treatment we will first of all present it at scientific meetings so this is usually international scientific meetings to share this idea with with the with the fraternity uh, and that allows us to have some discussion and have greater input from the other specialists and after it has gone through the presentation then we publish this this these findings uh, and before this, these results are accepted by any scientific journal, they are peer reviewed by the editorial board and the editorial board will send it out to their own independent experts uh, in this field to see if you know, the publication is uh, worth uh, printing and whether it's based on science. So that's how uh, medicine advances. So we always have to present and we always have to publish our findings. Uh, and the important thing is of this, um, Unlike some of the other professions, in medicine, we always want to let everyone know because um, if we have a new discovery, it's important that everyone knows so that they can then apply the, the new findings and provide the new treatment for, for patients so that the, the maximum amount of patients can benefit from the intervention. So, so the, op, the, the, uh, the initial results were good. The size of the aorta was stabilized. Uh, it didn't get bigger. And of course, then this led to further longer term follow up. So now this is follow up, up to six years. Uh, and it does show that where we have put the red around the aortic root, it has stabilized its size and not enlarged further uh, and, and, and uh, avoided the need for a major surgery in these cases. So as of May 2020, worldwide, more than 300 patients have now received this treatment. Um, and, and the longest follow-up is 16 years. So what I didn't mention is the very first patient who received this treatment uh, was Tel Goswati. He was the one who came up with this idea. So he came up with the idea, he convinced us to accept this idea, and he became the first patient to receive the treatment. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting. Uh, he is this patient, patient one, uh, at 16 years, and now he's 18 years uh, after having this, this procedure done. Uh, these are the age groups of the patient, and this, uh, the results, 99.3% um, uh, survival during the operation, 93% survival at nine years. Uh, the aim of this surgery is, of course, to prevent any aortic dissection or tear of the aorta, uh, and we achieved this in that there was no, none of this patient had a tear of the aorta, and three of these patients had reoperations at three, six, and nine years. Uh, this worked out to be 0.9%, which is actually very good results. Uh, even when you compare it to the, the conventional treatment, which is to replace the, the ascending aorta, and all the surviving patients are living full and active, active lives. So this is the uh, tel Goswati scans. Uh, you can see it's not changed at all in size since it was, uh, since he had the procedure. Uh, so it has uh, managed to stabilize the aorta. And uh, initially when the procedure was first started, because it was only done in one center, uh, and because we, were, we still had not in, enough 
data, you can see the, the numbers were very low. The ones in blue are the number of procedures done per year. And the ones in orange are the centers doing it. But once we started establishing the safety and effectiveness of the treatment, and then uh, started publishing the results, then you can see that more and more centers are, are providing this treatment now, and more and more patients are having this uh, treatment. Uh, and today, um, there are 28 centers uh, worldwide offering this treatment, uh, including one uh, center in, in Malaysia. So, so this, particular this particular treatment, personalized external aortic support, has gone through pilot studies and observational studies. It has not gone through clinical trials. Now, to do clinical trials in surgery is a little bit, a little bit more challenging because then you will have to tell the patient um, that you'll be allocated to one of two different groups. And often, uh, because surgery is quite a major undertaking, patients would not want to, to be assigned at random to different interventions. Uh, they would want the doctor to recommend a particular intervention. So doing clinical trials in surgery is a little bit more challenging. Uh, than doing clinical trials in, uh, with taking medications. But with this particular intervention, uh, the patients who are being treated with it are, are the patients who would not normally have the aorta replaced because the aorta is only starting to get big. Uh, so the idea of this treatment is to uh, support the aorta and prevent it getting any bigger uh, and, and avoid the need for uh, a big operation to, to replace the, the aorta. So some of the other newer treatments in uh, aortic surgery, uh, since we are on the aorta now, is that we have new devices. So this is a patient, you can see this is a, a CT scan and his aorta got aneurysm. But not only this part of the aorta, the higher part of the aorta where the head and neck vessels come out has also got big. So this patient would need a replacement, not only of what we call the ascending aorta, but also of the aortic arch. So to, to, um, uh, fortunately, we have got these new graphs, these new devices. You can see this is a graph which we would use to replace the patient's aorta. And you can see this graph already has all these branches coming out, which, will, which we can use to attach to the head and neck vessels. So years ago, we didn't have all this. We, we just had a sim simple tube, and then we had to join the head and neck vessels to a straight tube. But now we have all this these graphs which are built with all the branches already coming out. So it makes the surgery a lot easier. And then plus this one has a stent built into uh, the graph. So we can put this stent into the, uh, the, the descending aorta, the lower part of the aorta. So, so not only are we able to treat the ascending aorta, the arch, and uh, uh, we, we're not able to treat the, the, the descending aorta as well. So this, this newer sort of uh, devices have also allowed us to uh, provide more effective and safer treatments and make, make surgery a lot easier. Then of course, the, the techniques have also emerged a lot. So if you can imagine uh, to interrupt the blood supply to the brain, we would have to somehow perfuse the brain with, with blood and oxygen during the surgery. So we have now got newer uh, techniques to do that, uh, to, to allow us to continue to supply the brain with uh, blood and oxygen uh, when we are replacing the aortic arch. So these are some of the advances uh, which, which have come, come about and which have allowed us to uh, uh, provide this surgery uh, very safely. So this is a patient who had that new stand put in. Uh, you can see the uh, this patient's ascending aorta has been replaced by a graph. This is an artificial graph. And then beyond that, uh, a stand has been put in, the stand which has been attached uh, to the graph. So we have treated the ascending aorta and also the descending. Uh, and this patient uh, previously also had the same problem lower down in the aorta. So she has had stands put in all the way down uh, right until... So her, her whole aorta essentially has been either replaced or stented. So she should be protected from uh, further disease of the, of the aorta. And you can see this very nicely in the, in the chest x-ray. This, this method work are uh, the stents in her descending aorta. 
So uh, when the aneurysm involves the lower part of the aorta, what we call the descending aorta, this is the part which is bringing blood downwards to the, to the abdomen. Uh, nowadays, we don't usually need to replace it anymore. We can put stents in, uh, what we call endovascular stents. And this are uh, put in through a large artery in your groin uh, and then deployed. So this stent, for example, has been deployed in the descending aorta and it has excluded this aneurysm. So it's taken the pressure of the aneurysm, so it won't rupture. But even if it ruptures, it doesn't matter because there's no blood going through this area anymore. It's all going through the, uh, the stent. Uh, we are able to stand the descending aorta, but stenting the arch, this part here is a, a problem because it will block the blood supply to the brain. Uh, but there are techniques to do that, but those are still, uh, I would say, uh, experimented in, at the moment. So uh, diseases of the, uh, the aortic arch or the ascending aorta still require the conventional replacement of the aorta, but those in the descending aorta can be stented. Uh, and of course, this part of the aorta, uh, we can actually strengthen it uh, if, if the aorta is just mildly dilated uh, to prevent it uh, getting any, any bigger. So um, with research, we, we publish individual papers uh, based on indiv individual um, uh, research studies, but it is also useful to put all these studies together so these are what we call a review, review papers. So a review, or particularly a systematic review uh, uh, publications, which essentially gathers all the papers already published on a subject uh, and, and put it all together and, and analyze the results from various publications. So with this, we can put some perspective into individual publications uh, and then help provide some uh, some guidance or some overview of the different uh, treatment options available uh, and what is the best treatment for different conditions. So this is one of the reviews we have done on aortic disease research in Malaysia. Uh, I won't go through this publication because um, it's a little bit technical, uh, but it's published in the, the Medical Journal of, of Malaysia. And you will find uh, a lot of this uh, paper. So for those interested, I think Probably reading a review article would be best because that will, that if if you are not not uh, an expert in a particular subject, it's pro probably more useful to read a review article uh, because it will put the different studies into perspective. Uh, but, but of course, if you are a subject matter expert, then you can read the individual res research papers. Uh, but then you have to uh, be aware that. Uh, uh, if you're not an expert in the subject, you may not understand you know, the, the various things about that particular research. So but a review paper in general will put things into perspective uh, and, and at least come up with some uh, reasonable um, uh, recommendations on particular, particular treatments. Uh, we come down to the aortic valve. Uh, this is the valve we, we were speaking about the aorta uh, initial, uh, pre, uh, we have just been speaking about the aorta. Now, the aorta is separated from the heart by this valve called the aortic valve. Uh, the heart has got four valves and it essentially, the heart is a pump. So uh, because it's a pump, it needs to have valves. The, the valves uh, ensure that blood flows in one direction through the heart. So when the heart pumps, the blood will leave the heart then this valve here will have to close. So, the, so when the heart relaxes, the blood doesn't go back into the heart, it will stay outside. Uh, so, so that's how blood is able to move in one direction. Uh, but this valve can get faulty. Uh, usually it's due to old age. In some patients, as they get older, the valve gets faulty, it gets uh, stiff, it gets calcified, uh, it doesn't open properly. Uh, and when that happens, then, then the... Um, the blood is unable to leave the, the heart to the rest of the body. So in this condition, because it was, it's a structural problem, unfortunately, medication is uh, limited uh, use and you, you really need to replace the, the, the faulty valve with a new one. So this is a diagram where the, uh, the, the faulty valve has been removed and a new valve has been uh, stitched in. Uh, and... Uh, 
So this condition, when it happens, it, it can be quite distressing because it causes symptoms of angina, which is chest pain, uh, syncope, which is fainting, it can cause, cause patients to feel faint, and failure, meaning heart failure, so they can get short of breath. Uh, so it has an impact in their quality of life, but also it has an impact on their survival. So this is a graph showing their survival. And you can see that once patients develop symptoms, uh, if nothing is done, you can see the survival just drops very quickly uh, within a few years. Uh, so this is uh, certainly a, a very serious heart condition which would need uh, treatment uh, to uh, improve the patient's symptoms and also to allow them to, to live longer. Uh, and this is an ob observational study of the survival of patients of those who have the valve replaced versus those who do not have surgery. Uh, you can see the, the great differences in the survival with the, the two uh, interventions. So the, the, the valve used to, to uh, replace the aortic valve has also improved a lot. So this study here on the left is based on the orig original valve, uh, where you can see that um, how long the valve lasts, this this animal valve, this, this valve is made from uh, animal tissue. Uh, it, it depends on the patient's age. So this, this is the, on the y-axis, you see percentage free of explant for structural valve deterioration. So if you have a patient in their 70s, the valve will last about 15 years uh, before it starts uh, deter uh, deteriorating. But if you have a very young patient in the 50s, then you can see it starts to deteriorate after about, uh, about nine years. Uh, so, uh, and that's because in younger patients, they're more active. So uh, they do more exercise. Uh, so there's a greater strain on the, on the heart valve. So these animal valves are, are very suitable for the older patients uh, in their seventies, but not so suitable for the younger patients uh, because it does not last uh, so, so long. But having said that, there are newer valves, newer generation valves which have emerged, uh, such as this one, uh, in which it is meant to last much longer than, than, than this. And this is tested in the laboratory. They put the valve through various cycles in the, uh, in the laboratory. Uh, and the modeling suggests that this valve would last uh, a lot, lot longer than, than what is shown in the studies. But of course, we do not know for certain, I mean, to be absolutely sure we have to wait for 20 years. Uh, that's a very long time to wait to, to know the true durability of the valve. But based on the laboratory studies, the newer generation valves uh, should last uh, a lot longer than, uh, than, than the, uh, the current, current valves. But even so, in the younger patients, we will advise generally uh, a different type of valve, a metal valve. Uh, which would last the, their lifetime. But the disadvantage with this metal valve is that they need to go on a blood thinning medication called warfarin. Uh, I, I think some of the audience may be on warfarin. Uh, it's not a big problem, but it does have some drawbacks in that uh, you need to ensure that the, uh, the level of the, uh, the, the blood thinning properties of, of this medication are adequate. So you need a blood test, at least everyone of talk once or twice, um, uh, once every uh, one or two months. And also there are certain food you need to avoid because uh, vitamin K containing food found in green vegetables, for example, interact with the warfarin. So there are some disadvantages with this uh, medication, uh, but I think in younger patients, the, uh, the metal valve is advisable, unless the patient is willing to go through a second operation. There are some patients who absolutely do not want to take warfarin. So there are some who are very active, they are they're engaged in contact sports, so they go into remote areas, uh, the hiking and so on, uh, and they don't want to take warfarin. Uh, so those, those patients, uh, some of them do ask for a tissue valve, the younger patients, but they have to be aware that they are all certainly going to need a second operation at some stage in, in their life if they, if they opt for a tissue valve. So one of the newer techniques which have emerged with, with the uh, aortic valve is this transcatheter uh, aortic valve implantation or TAVI, 
whereby we can replace the uh, aortic valve uh, without the need for open surgery. So we can put, so, so the, we can crush this valve into uh, about a centimeter in size and then uh, push it up through this device in the aorta, through the arch, and then uh, insert it inside the faulty valve and then deploy this valve inside the old valve. So essentially this valve pushes open the old valve uh, and then replaces it. So this is a new, new pr procedure. It's actually not that new. It's been around for more than 10 years. Uh, and it is recommended, it is the recommended treatment for the older patients uh, who are unfit for conventional surgery. So, uh, so in, for patients in their 80s, 80 and above, uh, if they have this particular condition with uh, severe, what we call severe aortic stenosis, uh, this is the recommended treatment because it can be uh, done with, uh, uh, the recovery is a lot faster with this procedure. As you can imagine, there's no cut in the, there's no cut, there's only a small cut in the groin. So patients can go home very quickly and they can recover from this procedure very fast. But for the younger patients, uh, we are still not recommending this treatment um, uh, because, the, the dura because of the durability. You can, this is of course a tissue-based valve. So, uh, so it won't last as long uh, in the younger patients. Uh, and also, um, uh, the younger patients have a very low risk for, for heart surgery. So when you balance the risks and benefits for younger patients, uh, we still recommend the conventional surgical aortic valve replacement because it will last longer in those patients and it will also uh, give better results uh, for those patients. So these are all based on uh, what I mentioned earlier, clinical trials. So there have been several clinic clinical trials on this TAVI Tavi valve, and this is a systematic review which has grouped together all the studies. And you can see that there are about 6,000 uh, patients in this study. Uh, so they have compared the two types of valves. The ones in blue are the, the Tavi valve, so the new, the new valve. And the line in red is the surgical valve, surgical uh, valve. And this is the incidence uh, of all cause mortality. So how many patients die after the procedure? Uh, and this is the time after implantation, the x-axis. So you can see in the first year, the first 12 months, the, the results with TAVI is better compared to conventional surgery. So less of the patients who have the, the TAVI valve uh, have died uh, and more of the surgical valves uh, have died uh, in the first year after the procedure. Uh, in the time between the first year, after the first year, and before the third year, so between one to three years, uh, these survival curves actually equalize. So then there's no difference between the two treatments. Both groups of patients live as long. Uh, beyond 40 months or beyond about three years, you can see then the results reverse. Uh, those who have PAVI have uh, increased risk of dying compared to those who have the surgical valve. Those who have the surgical valve replacement are living longer after three years. So this is where the, the guidelines have come in that uh, the older patients, uh, they may not see the benefit of the surgical aortic valve replacement. So, so the newer valves are still recommended for the older patients, particularly because the risk of the open surgery in those patients are higher. But for the younger patients who are, are fairly fit and well, apart from this problem with the heart valve, then a surgical aortic valve replacement is still better uh, because it will help them to live longer uh, and, uh, and ensure that they have a better quality of life in, in the longer term. So the, 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 there's increased mortality with TAVI compared to surgical aortic valve replacement after three years. But one of the advantages of this TAVI valve is that we are able to treat patients who would previously not have undergone any intervention. So those patients would typically, before the emergence of the TAVI valve, valve had just continued on medical treatment. And you can see from the earlier uh, studies I presented, the differences between in survivor, between those who had the uh, valve replacement 
versus those who have just medical treatment. So at least with the Tavi valve, we are able to treat those who are unfit for surgery and are able to improve their quality of life and also their survival uh, compared to, to taking medications.